it's a great, great pleasure to have you all here. And it's a special occasion for us at the Amani Institute since we are hosting our two co-founders, Roshan Paul and Ilaina Rabat, who have just published The New Reason to Work. It's a book based on their experience leading our organization for 10 years. So what is this book and their experience about? It's about developing people who want to lead change and helping them build their career in the social sector. This has been the mission of Amani Institute that we are achieving through the postgraduate certificate in social innovation management and a variety of other programs. I'm glad to share that the book is already in the Amazon top bestseller list. And today we will have the opportunity to learn directly from the authors the six essential keys that can unlock a dream career in social impact. Let me add that I am personally very excited to have them here and listen to their insight and experience because I am myself part of this experience since I am one of the 600 fellows from 70 countries who have followed the transformational journey that they have designed. And I hope many of you can do the same. Uh, so now let me introduce Ilaina, Ilaina Rabat from Argentina, who holds two master's degrees, one in applied positive psychology and one in international studies and peace and conflict resolution. She has been working for social change since she was a teenager in Latin America, North America, Africa, and Europe, serving in organization as the Open Society Foundation and Ashoka prior to founding Amani Institute. She is today an advisory board member of NGOs and social enterprises in Brazil, UK, India, and Spain, and she's also a certified executive coach. Russian Paul, Russian from India, has a master in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and a bachelor's in international political economy from Davidson College. He met Ilaina at Ashoka, where he also worked for a decade, and today he serves on the board of advisory council of several of several, I see someone needs to mute themselves, of several innovative educational organizations in the USA, Netherlands, and India. I believe this very short introduction give you a sense of the depth and breadth of their experience. So let's start this masterclass that will last about 50 minutes so we can ensure there's also time for Q&A. Uh, it will be an interactive class. There will be moments where you're also invited to act and be in breakout rooms. Uh, Roshan, Ilaina, the stage is yours and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Francesca. Um, great to be back with the Amani Institute uh, community and group of people. It's been a long time uh, since, uh, since I last got to do this, so very excited to be here. Um, one thing we thought might be nice as we, you know, as a small way to get to know who's on the call as well, is if you could uh, add your location perhaps to your uh, screen, uh, so to your name, so that we can get a sense of where everyone is. If you feel comfortable putting your screen on, or your camera on, that would be great as well. Um, so, but otherwise, probably best to be on mute uh, so that we can just make sure that uh, it's a good listening experience for everyone. Okay, so with that, um, let's kick this off. I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, we'll get started. So welcome to this masterclass on impact first jobs, right? Uh, we're calling it the why, the what, and the how of impact first jobs. And this presentation is going to be based on our book that just came out uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the new reason to work, how to build a career that will change the world. And so if you are interested in building your career in social impact or to get a new lease of inspiration uh, to you know, expand your career in social impact at whatever age you may be or whatever career stage you may be, uh, then this book will, is for you and may be uh, helpful for you to, to do that. So uh, we launched the book two weeks ago. It's, it's doing well on Amazon and it's available in most parts of the world on your local Amazon. So uh, feel free to check it out there. And, and if not, you know, you can also find on the website a list of places where you can get the book as well. So our website is thenewreasontowork.com and you can find it there as well. So let's jump in uh, to our content for today. And 
We'll start with actually showing you a little video uh, that talks about the background for the book. So it's just a one minute video. So I'm gonna play that and uh, we'll kick off the content of the webinar after that. The story of this book began 10 years ago in a small office in Washington, DC, when Roshan from India and Elena from Argentina met. Over the next 10 years, they helped more than 10,000 people from more than 65 countries move towards both making a living and making a difference. Doing this, they learned what it takes to start, shape and sustain a career that can change the world. And in this book, through a series of conversations with people just like you, they answer some important questions, such as, what are your career options in impact work? How can you take control of your education? And why does owning your story matter? I could tell you more now, but, well, that would be a spoiler. And we all know that spoilers are really bad. So pick up a copy and join the movement. We're excited to see how you, too, will change the world. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Part of the reason we wanted to share it was to give you a quick background about the, uh, you know, what led to the book, but also because the video was made by two Amani Fellows. So you heard Francesca in the introduction talk about how she's an Amani Fellow. And this video was actually made by two Amani Fellows, the person who was narrating it, as well as the person who did the um, illustrations. So, um, you know, this is just uh, a good way for us to share the role and impact that Amani Fellows are also having in the world. So with that, I'm going to move to, to start the content uh, of this presentation. We're going to speak for probably the next 25 or so minutes, telling you a little bit about the background of the book and the book, and then we'll give you a chance to reflect on some of the content that we have presented. So we'll partner you up with another person on the call and you'll get a chance to reflect on what you, you learned through this masterclass. So why are we doing this book? Uh, or why did we write this book now? We believe that there's a rising demand for impact work, right? The people, you know, if you're on this call, you are interested in making your career have to do with social impact and you are not alone. All around the world, there are millions of people who are trying to do just that, who are doing just that. And so we believe that this demand is also changing the job market, right? It's forcing organizations, it's forcing companies to be more oriented towards the role that they are playing in the world. You know, we've seen a lot of this with regard to diversity and inclusion, um, you know, in the aftermath of the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd, um, you know, murder that happened. And uh, we're seeing that this is pushing a lot of companies to do things differently. A uh, similar thing is happening because of climate change and sustainability as well. So more and more people are trying to um, move towards careers and impact, and that's also changing the job market. And in addition to that, we've also seen the impacts of COVID, uh, the global pandemic that has really made a lot of people rethink what they want to do with their career. Uh, in some parts of the West, particularly, you know, the UK and the US, but other places too, we're seeing this phenomenon called the great resignation, where a lot of people are leaving their jobs without any sense of what they're going to do next, but just because they're fed up uh, with, you know, companies not treating them uh, very well. And all of this is leading to, you know, many people to rethink what the future of work is. You know, we've been having a conversation for the last decade, maybe, or five years about the future of work. And that conversation is typically focused around technology, how things like artificial intelligence and blockchain are going to change the way we do work. And what we believe is actually because of the COVID, because of the great resignation, there's a new part of the conversation of the future of work, and that's how do we want workplaces to be? Uh, what is the purpose of work itself? And uh, we believe that that is increasingly going to be about the role of impact in, in, in our careers and in uh, all kinds of jobs, right? So today, more and more jobs are increasingly impact-first jobs. And when we say impact-first, 
What we mean is that the majority of your time working in an impact plus job is about having an impact in the world that goes beyond your own bottom line or your organization or companies or, or shareholders bottom line and is trying to do something that would benefit society at large. So when we say impact first jobs, we mean jobs that are first about making an impact and only second about you know, profits or salaries and, and things like that. And we think that because of some of the trends that I just described, that all jobs in the future will be impact first jobs. You know, um, we've seen that impact work has evolved over the last, let's say, 150 years or so. You know, it started off with just a few foundations and uh, philanthropists that were starting to fund local nonprofits and so on. And then it grew to large non-governmental organizations like famous ones like the Red Cross and Save the Children and Amnesty International, you know, the, the really famous NGOs. Um, and that led to in post World War II in particular, we started to see the launch of multilateral and government aid agencies. So organizations like the United Nations and the World Bank um, or government agencies like USAID or um, GIZ if you're in Germany and uh, also governments that are giving money to support development in other parts of the world. In the 1980s, we saw the rise of social businesses and social enterprises, uh, and that increasing professionalization of social impact work led to the rise of intermediaries. So these are organizations that are not working directly with uh, marginalized populations, but supporting the organizations working with those populations. So you think about consulting firms, research firms, training firms. So all of these are rapidly growing in social impact as well. In 2006, we saw Mohamed Yunus from the Grameen Bank win the Nobel Peace Prize, which was another recognition of the role of microfinance um, and kickstarted a huge movement of microfinance organizations, institutions, impact investors, um, and other such organizations that were trying to find innovative ways of financing social change. Increasingly today, as we described already, corporations are getting into the act. You know, the chief sustainability officer, for instance, is one of the fastest growing uh, roles in, in the private sector today, as more and more corporations are getting into social impact as part of their work. So we see that this trend is going to keep continuing and more jobs than ever before will be social impact jobs. So if you are not currently working in social change and you want to, um, maybe you're finding it a bit hard to break in or you're not sure how to start. If there's one thing that you should be aware of and, and maybe helps you to you know, um, be happier is that there's never been a greater set of opportunities to make a good living and also make a difference doing social impact work uh, today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Elena. Well, let me just say with this, so this is a line from the book uh, in which we say that, uh, you know, we believe that the future of work is one in which your job description will include not only your title, responsibility, salary, but also a convincing case for the impact your work will create, right? So um, that future job descriptions will try to convince people not only um, you know, because of what they're going to do, but also what change that they're going to make in the world. So that's our vision for the future. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elena to take over from here. Thank you, Roshan. So I think that Roshan already mentioned what are the impact first jobs. So if you want to go to the next slide, Roshan, you will have there the exact quote from the book. But basically, we believe that it's not that you have to have an NGO work, uh, to be able to have an impact first job, you can have it anywhere, right? If you are in government, in a company, in a small business, in a social business, in the UN, anywhere, you can have a social impact uh, work. So as Rosen said, I encourage you to, even if you're not yet working with social impact, you can start doing some change in the job that you are currently having. So it's really like a challenge for you to, yeah, you can have impact any place, anywhere. So start right after this conversation. So then what we want to really share that the, the big part of this master class is how to do that, right? Because it's, it's good to say, yes, the numbers are raising, there are more jobs, it's the right moment to do it. But then many people get paralyzed. Okay, yes, but I have no idea how to get into that uh, job. I mean, ha, ha, how to do what I really want to do, right? So we're going to describe, and the book actually does that, seven keys in how to do that. 
So we're going to alternate with Russian one on one. So we also change voices and you don't get uh, tired of any of us. So the first one is uh, the first piece around education. And you can go over if you want to the next one. And it's about really owning again your own education. Somehow we have delegated our education and education comes in a box, right? You study law and you have like a box about law. You study, I don't know, international affairs and you have like another box there. And it's ready. You have the curriculum, you start into the classrooms, you get fed uh, knowledge, and then you try to put that into practice. We challenged that. We said, no, don't do that. Actually build your own education. There is nothing yet fully designed apart from a man institute is offering, but that's of course I'm biased, but I truly believe that's the reason we created a man institute because we believe there was no education for that, for social impact jobs. But apart from that, if you want to really have your own education, you have to go really find it. So travel, do internships, build your own projects, um, have mentors, have coaches, uh, do experiential learning experiences. So really own your education again. In the book, and that's in the next slide, we describe what could be some of the methodologies and some of the principles to find your education. So for example, we said it should be a holistic education. What does that mean? That is not only about, I don't know, like poverty. It's about yourself also. It's about the community. So it's really holistic. It should be experiential. So it's not only about reading, about listening, but it's about doing, right? And then in the methodologies, we name and describe some methodologies, but one that is very important for, for me is learning by doing. And it's really learning on the job. And you will tell me, yes, but I don't have a job. I'm actually doing this to find the job, right? So then what I respond is, that doesn't matter. Like you can do your own project. You can actually have an internship. And those are the best ways to two things, to actually get to know the sector or the social impact uh, job. And second one, to actually find a job. So those are some of the things that are in that chapter and it's about designing your own education, own your education. Russian. Yep. So um, we'll go to our next key, which is uh, what we call aligning who you are with what you do. Okay, and that's because being a change maker is not a traditional job, you know, where you clock in and clock out and measure your, um, your day with very traditional ways. Social impact work tends to often be deeply personal. We wouldn't be getting into this line of work if we didn't feel a personal connection to what we are doing, right? If we didn't feel that there is an injustice in the world or there is an opportunity that we want to, uh, to um, you know, target. Uh, and so it's, it has a personal connection to us as, uh, as a human. Um, and so that's why, you know, understanding who you are and aligning that with what you do is really quite important. Um, you know, so what we say, it's like aligning your inner self, your body, heart and mind with your outer self, your behaviors out in the world. And that leads to the impact that you want to have, right? So you must always be conscious of this interplay between who you are, what you do, and how that leads to the impact. And it's important because if you're not conscious of this, right, if you aren't clear about how your motivations are impacting uh, how you show up in the world, then you might bring some of your own shadows, some of your own, um, you know, things that have gone on, your traumas from your, your life into your work. And that's not fair to your colleagues, not fair to the communities you want to work with. So starting with yourself, you know, change from the inside out is very important if you're going to do social impact work. So transformational leaders, so people who are making change, they align usually their wisdom, their understanding and knowledge, right? So uh, these are three things that you want to try to align um, your wisdom, who you are, what you know deeply to be true, your values um, with your understanding, you know, um, what, what change you want to make in the world, what you truly believe needs to be changed and bringing that to the knowledge that you have, your technical skills, your abilities, um, you know, and, and applying all three together to make a difference in the world, right? It's like walking this tightrope um, where you align, you know, 
your wisdom, understanding, knowledge. And when you start to feel a bit shaky, you know, reconnecting to your purpose, reconnecting to your values, understanding your mental models, understanding your beliefs. These are the things that can help you to um, come back to the center. So you stay on the tightrope, right? And in this chapter in the book, we walk through all of these things, your signs of awakening, purpose, values, beliefs, and so on. So you get to understand how to align all of that uh, in uh, service of the work that you want to do or the change that you want to make in the world. Thank you, Roshan. So if we go to key number three, is one of the main skills that we believe not only people working in the social sector should have, but actually everyone working, or everyone living in this planet. And it's about social innovation. So it does, it's, it's very common that even in university or in the workplace, we find people that is very good at spotting problems, right? Or, or seeing what is missing, what is not working well, and sharing that. That's good, but it's half of the answer, right? What we need also is having a mindset where we not only see what is not working, but how to fix it, right? Be open to understand how, how we can create new solutions to solve problems. And this is particularly important for social impact because we know that the problems that we are facing are very complex and not simple, right? So we need to be very innovative, very open-minded to see new solutions. So in this chapter, we tell some stories of, of a many fellows that have been through this journey in creating new things for all problems. And one of the key, um, I would say, like ability that you need to have to be an innovator is basically asking more questions. That's the first one that you can see in the chapter. And it's not about really looking for answers at the beginning, but it's asking questions, open questions. When you see something that is not working, ask questions. And this is especially important for people that is transitioning jobs. It's very common that someone wants to work in social impact and it's a new job in the social impact sector. And uh, you maybe see everything with your own lenses. If you're a lawyer, you see things from law. If you're a doctor, from medicine, right? So we challenge everyone that when you are in a new place, in a new sector, to ask a lot of questions before trying to bring solutions, before trying to fix things, right? So that's very important. The other one is uh, really doing or what we said is prototyping right so we have different keys here but one is about prototyping and it's about yes we may think you have the right solution in theory but only when you tested it when you actually see how people interact with it and change it then it's the right solution so social innovation means not only asking more questions open ended questions it's also about testing your ideas to see how people react to them and be willing to change them and be flexible to change them again that's key number three. Great, thanks, Sila. Um, we'll move to key number four. And uh, this is about networking, right? I'm sure all of you on this call know the word networking. I know, I'm sure that some of you love it. You really enjoy networking. And I'm sure that some of you hate it. Um, you don't like networking. And the reason you don't like networking is probably because you feel that there's something inauthentic about it. It's a bit fake. Uh, or there's something very transactional about it. It's like, what can you get from people and what can they get from you? Um, and you don't like a transactional approach to relationships. And this is very common, right? I think most people actually don't enjoy networking. But what we believe is that you don't have to think about networking that way. There are many uh, different ways of thinking about it. And we, rather than you know, calling it like doing networking, we prefer the word network weaving. Um, weaving isn't done in a rush. It takes time and careful effort, right? So we say that like, rather than thinking about networking as going to a conference and a cocktail hour, you know, where everyone's exchanging business cards, think about it instead as a um, one-on-one -on -one coffee meeting with someone, right? And you do lots and lots of those um, in order to, to be a better network or build a better network. So in this chapter, we show you how to approach networking in a different way. And we have these four principles, you know, so the first one I already explained, think of it as coffees, not cocktails, you know, think of it as relationship building and not business card exchanging, right? The second one is um, what we say, how may I help you is the most important five words in networking is not what can I get from you? It's how may I help you? If we found from our own experience that if you go into networking with an approach of, you know, helping others, then it makes you a lot more relaxed. 
Um, it makes you feel like the sense of joy that comes from serving and supporting and helping others. But it also means that things come back to you in the long run and you do benefit from it as well. The third principle is being yourself. Uh, you know, and this is really getting to uh, this idea of that networking is you have to be inauthentic and put on a mask or a fake persona. And we truly believe that that's not the case. You can be who you are, be yourself, bring your true self to the table, and that will lead you to the types of um, you know, interactions and opportunities that you will like because it's closer uh, to your own truth and who you are. And finally, um, this is an important tip. What, you know, instead of best friends forever, we're saying best acquaintances forever. And that's because you know, when it comes to networking, it's not, it is important to, uh, you know, to uh, network with your, uh, you know, your friends, your colleagues, your alumni networks, and so on. But it's even more powerful usually to, to go to people that you know very um, loosely, that they're not close friends, they're acquaintances, you've met them a few times. And there's a lot of research that shows that it's those people that actually, um, you know, lead you to your next best opportunities, as opposed to the people that are closest to you. And uh, this is something that, you know, I'm finding out to be true right now, actually, uh, in my own life. So, so I'm excited to share that as well in this chapter. And I'll turn it over to Ila. Thank you, Russian. So I think that the connection with the next key is very important uh, because it's about your story. And it's linked with networking because sometimes we feel that when we are doing networking, we have to tell our story in a very professional way, in a very CV oriented way, telling where you studied, what you did, your job. And yes, that's important, but the way you share that is even more important. So what we are aiming here as a key is that in order for you to connect with other ones, in order for you to be able to really have a relationship with someone, it's about owning your story in a very authentic way. To be the most effective way to do that is when you actually are able to share authentically who you are to the other person. So one of the principles that we tell with the storytelling is about making it personal. So it's not about only telling where I study, what I did, but how I felt, some story, something funny that happened, right? Make it very personal and especially saying why this is important. So if you're looking for a job with a poverty or with environment, why the job is important for you? So the why behind that. The other thing that is important for me storytelling is the number three, that is show, don't tell, right? So sometimes we, we feel that whatever we are saying and it will stick, right? But it's not true. Actually, people will believe us when we tell them things that we have done, right? When we can show with act. So whatever you can say and share with showing, not only telling, that is important. And when I say showing means that give examples, right? And can be even if you have a portfolio for an online website where you have everything, you can show there, not only tell what you have done. So that's what's important. And then the other thing why it's important in storytelling is in order to help you build a career narrative. And that is not something that to take it easily, you need to be able to tell people why in this moment you want to work with social impact or want to accelerate your career in social impact and should have a narrative, should have a, a reason to make that, the dots should connect, right? So starting from why you're doing what you're doing, the different insights that you have to your career and what is your vision to do next, right? So you need to really build that story and that narrative. So all these steps, again, are already with really good examples in, in the book, but basically not something that you do randomly. It's something that you do it like with time is time, you write it down, you practice it, and you may need to change it depending on the audience that, that, that you are really uh, encountering, right? So check your time to own your story and to share and to learn how to share your story in an effective way. Thanks, Ila. And with that, we'll go to the sixth and the, um the last key for now before we turn it over to you to get to do some uh, reflective work yourself. So this last key is uh, what we say is realizing it's a marathon, right? Um, and that's because if you think about it, the problems that we see around us in society, uh, whether it comes to poverty or hunger or education, um, they've been with us for centuries, right? These are problems that have been there for a very long time. And so they're not going to be solved overnight. 
And so if you're going to work in social change, it's really important to realize that this is, you know, work that is going to take your entire career, your entire life, perhaps, you know, and once you realize that, you start to understand that it's important to pace yourself, right? Uh, like in a marathon, you don't sprint the whole way, you pace yourself. Um, and so, you know, when you think about it that way, you realize that there are many other things that are also important. You've got to make sure you're taking care of yourself, of your family, of the people around you. And, um, and that's really important if you're going to not become cynical too fast, not become disillusioned by, you know, when things don't go the way you want them to, right? So it's really important to pace yourself over your career. And as we've studied, uh, you know, the people who've done this, we have seen that there's perhaps two kinds of people, you know, in social change, you know. Uh, some people, we call them thrivers. Um, thrivers are people who believe uh, that they are making a difference in people's lives. It brings them joy, it brings them happiness, and they go through life, uh, you know, feeling quite fulfilled. By contrast, we'll, we look at survivors. These are people who are doing the same work as thrivers, but they're not experiencing the same positive emotions from it, right? Um, they, see, they see a lot more disillusionment, a lot more cynicism um, than the thrivers do, right? And we believe that this is something that you can overcome. There are ways in which you can not be a survivor or just a survivor, but you can actually thrive, right? And we created a dashboard to help people to navigate uh, this uh, dilemma. Right? And this is what the dashboard looks like. It's got these nine uh, variables. And uh, we believe that you can you know, uh, think about where you are on each of these and take steps to improve your position. And by taking those steps to improve your position, you are more likely to be a thriver, right? So some of these are, are you intrinsically motivated, right? Are you coming at it from a place of true uh, desire to solve a problem? Um, or are you coming at it from, you know, you just want to win awards or um, make a lot of money and things like that, right? So is the motivation coming from uh, inside you or is it coming from outside you from external things, right? Um, another thing that is important is, um, are you aware of what you can and cannot change, right? It's, it's the problems that we face can be quite massive sometimes and we have to be quite clear what is it that we are trying to change and what is it that we cannot change you know thrivers are people who are more comfortable with choosing not only what they are going to do but also what they're not going to do right whereas survivors sometimes can see the scale of problems and get a bit overwhelmed by that and feel like no change is happening or no progress is possible Right. Um, so those are just two of the, the nine different variables that will help you to see whether you're more of a survivor, more of a thriver and ways in which you can become, uh, you know, a better thriver. Um, and again, this is all in service of thinking about it, that it's, it's not a short term rush to the finish line. It's not a sprint. Uh, social change, a social impact work is a marathon. And you have to think about think about it across your whole career and across your whole life. So with that, we want to move you into a, a chance to reflect on your own, and Ila is going to walk us through that. Thank you, Roshan. So we went through the six key, and I'm aware that it was very fast, and probably some of the keys are not yet very clear. It's not an intention for you to buy the book, but I think that you should. But we were trying to try to put everything in, in the short time that we had. But basically, you can see here the six keys. And we would like you now to go into a breakout room in pairs uh, to really understand from those six keys that we described, the one that you understood at least, which one do you think you are like, okay, you have the expertise, you don't need to really work so much on those keys. And which is the one that you really want to improve? It's about building your education. It's about alignment with your passion and what you do. It's about be, being more innovator. It's about being better at networking. It's about telling your story in a better way. Or it's about really taking care of yourself to be able to sustain yourself and your impact in the long run, right? And then when you decide which one is the one that you want to improve, is, is there anything that you're going to start doing tomorrow to improve that key? So with that said, and Miley and Frag are going to go into the record room for around seven minutes. So that means that three and a half minutes for each person to share or you can do a conversation. When you enter, say hi, say your name, where you're from, and then start answering these questions. I'm going to paste it on the chat. 
so you can also have the question when you go to the breakout room. And let me see if there are any questions. So basically, you will go into the breakout room and you're going to answer to with the key that you feel more comfortable with and with the one that you want to start improving and what you can do to start improving that key. So that is the questions there. And I'm also going to put here the six keys in case you need that. And from my list, whenever you want, you can just start sending people to the breakout room. And when we are back, we are going to share key number seven that is hidden in the conclusion. So we're looking forward to get you back here to share the last key and then go into the Q&A. So welcome everyone. I'm going to go now through the last key. And uh, please, if you start having questions, you can start typing them on the chat. We are going to spend the last eight minutes or so uh, answering questions. So feel free to start typing them on the chat. So key number seven, is here on the conclusion. And it's basically about Sometimes in life, we plan everything, right? We have done the six key perfectly. We know where we are aiming. We want this type of job. We want this type of new position. And we're doing everything exactly to go towards that way. And then suddenly an opportunity coming our way and uh, we see it and we take it. But sometimes we don't see them and we don't take it, right? And that life can be two different trajectories, right? So number seven is about look at opportunities and uh, be open to something new, the unknown, to something different to what you're hoping for or expecting for, and be courageous enough to take it because you don't know where that could lead. It could be going to a very actually good place and a different place. And that's what happened actually to me and Roshan. We were, were in, in DC uh, at the Ashoka building and we had a meeting that we didn't know where it would take us. And we decided to take an opportunity to actually go and open a money institute. And that changed our life completely right i was not looking for that first i wasn't looking for that and it happens right so it's an invitation for the going into the unknown uh be courageous enough and take it even though you want something different why not what if destiny has a different plan for you take on it so with that we are closing the seven keys of the book and the main question for you to think through the book is are you ready to be like a career that will change the world because if you want to do it then the other thing is really methodologies, really tools to, to make it happen, right? Of course, always luck is important, but the tools are even more important. So if you're ready, just go for it. So that's the main question. With that, uh, we are closing. We are uh, inviting you to join the conversation, uh, not only to buy the book, to visit the website, but more importantly, to work with impact, if that is what you want. Because that will not only change you internally, but also will change the world and humanity. So we really challenge you to go and do that. So now, if you have questions, we are open to questions or comments or critiques or recommendations or experiences, whatever you want to share, we are open to do that. So the floor now is all yours. We talked for a long time. Mm -hmm. So now questions are very open. And this is the moment where anyone open questions, right? So if you want, if you feel more comfortable speaking out loud and asking the questions to everyone, please do that. And if you feel more comfortable typing, please do that. You know, that I can question is sharing, so go for it. Ila, I have a question for you both, just to warm up, <laughs> to make everyone comfortable in asking questions. Uh, you have been training a lot of people through the Social Innovation Management Program. And is there a common trait you have seen in all these fellows that you have been working with? Is there something they have in common, a value they share that you think is immediately visible in all of them? Hmm. I like Rashmila, that question. Any of you? Sure, I can kick off. Um, I think that we see a few things in common maybe, but one thing that really stands out is people who are, you know, have a hunger uh, to do something to change the world, right? People who don't want to accept the status quo that uh, the world is it as it is because of good reasons, who see that change is possible and they want to do something about it. So these are people who are willing to take the responsibility to step up, you know, when others won't and uh, to do what they can to make a difference or at least to to learn how they can do that um, and how they can prepare themselves to do that. So that's one thing that comes to my mind. And just to complement, I think that probably the reason you're asking that question, Fry, is because the audience is, is very 
uh, it's a variety of people, right? So we have people in the program that come from all over the world. You said like more than 70 countries, right? We have people coming from the private sector, from the social sector, from governments, people that are 20 years old, people that are 60 years old. So the question makes sense because the audience is quite diverse. But what everyone has in common is that, yes, they have hope. Uh, they know things can be better. And they are change makers. They want to make it happen, right? They don't want to only read about it or research about it, but they want to actually be very hands-on and make the change. So I really like that. It's, co it's courage, really, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. I see there's a question in the chat, so maybe you want to take it directly? Yes. Yeah, but Angela, very good question. Uh, it's about sustainability. So I would say that definitely one of the things to make it sustainable is key number six on the book. That is about not only think about how to make sustainable your project, but how to make yourself sustainable. So there is always people behind every project, right? And uh, we know that if people is not in the right place, acting from the right values uh, with the right teams, the solution won't happen in the long time, right? In the long term. So think about yourself also in order to think about sustainability. That would be one of the tips for me. Roshan, another one. Um, no, I think we can move on. So let's see. I think there's another question. Um, either you have a job that can pay well or you can take a job that has social impact, but probably on that list. Yep. Um, good question, Brendan. So I think that this is definitely a strong perception out there. Um, mm -hmm. I think that um, to some extent, there's some truth to this, that uh, there are some jobs with impact that don't pay very well. Um, but increasingly, this is not entirely the truth. Uh, there's a growing set of jobs as the social impact sector gets more and more professional, as lots of different actors join the sector from impact investors to consulting firms uh, to companies. Um, and then of course you've got the big government agencies. Uh, these are all organizations that actually pay quite well. So uh, you may not make the same amount of money as a hedge fund manager, let's say, or a top corporate lawyer maybe, but there's certainly a number of jobs in social impact where you can make you know, uh, easily enough money to lead a very privileged uh, lifestyle. And this is growing. And there are more of these jobs today than there ever have been. So I think there's truth to this. There's definitely a strong perception, as you put it. Um, but I don't think that this is entirely true anymore. And it's fast changing as well. And the thing that I would complement, Russian, is that uh, definitely 100% what you said. And the other thing is that I think that when you look for a job that is aligned with yourself, you also tend to change yourself, your style of living, what do you like buying, and how do you like to spend your money. So even sometimes when we make less money, because as Roshan said, there are jobs in the social sector that you will actually make less money, you align your life in a way that that money actually is a lot in the way that you're living. So rethink also that. I mean, having a job that has impact also changes you in the way you act in your life and the way you spend your money. Great. Um, looks like we have a question from Alberto um, about getting into a situation where you have an impact job, but in the end, it's not an impact first job as you dreamed and how to manage the change. Well, um, this is also a situation that can happen quite often. Um, working in impact is not easy. Um, you, you know, uh, organizations can struggle with that. I don't know the particular situation that you are, you know, obviously in Alberto that you are talking about. Um, but what I will say is that uh, in the Amani Institute program, uh, we, have a, um, we have a course on entrepreneurship skills. And this is all about how do you help organizations to make change from within? Or how do you become the kind of change maker that can help your organization move towards um, you know, something better, right? Whether in this case, maybe they're saying it's impact first, but it's not impact first. Maybe you can help them to uh, live up to their values or live up to their mission in a way, right? So of course it would be hard to, you know, without knowing the specifics of your situation to comment on that, but um, there's a number of ways in which you can build your skills to maybe to you know, help your organization to do better. And if that doesn't work either, maybe there is just time to change as well. And that's perfectly acceptable and normal too. And then going to the next question from Virag. 
Well, I would say that the main community should be a money institute, uh, to be very honest, because that's, I mean, what you are seeing is also what we saw when we started the money institute, that there was a gap, right? That people that was working with social impact were not practitioners, they were not ready, really, or reflective practitioners to actually do their job better. So I would say that joining a money institute would be definitely a good option. I would recommend the practice to, to learn from all the people there, because we are all practitioners, a very good reflective practitioner there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's take Felipe's question. Um, what are the barriers for people to engage in impact work? Again, I think, you know, the, the barriers are going to be different in different parts of the world uh, for different people in different career stages. So the barriers for someone starting their career may be different than someone, you know, 20 or 30 years into their career. Um, I do think that one of the barriers that may be quite universal and common is awareness actually that you know people aren't aware of the set of opportunities that there are right um that's one of the things we said in the beginning about how the set of opportunities and, and chapter two in the book we really go into this the the huge range of opportunities and impact work today that didn't exist 15 or 20 or 30 years ago certainly didn't exist when our parents and our teachers and our career counselors were building their careers so oftentimes you know, our opinions are formed by what our parents or our professors say, but they're not usually so updated um, as to what's actually the, the truth or what's actually going on today. So I think awareness is one barrier, regardless of which career stage you are at. And of course, with the move towards remote work and with the move towards, um, you know, digital nomads or, you know, the, whatever you may call it, like uh, with the pandemic, I think there's even more opportunities because again, companies and NGOs are looking to hire people from wherever they are. They don't have to be in the same geography, you know? So if you're in a part of the world where you don't have many impact first jobs, um, maybe you can connect to other parts of the world where they, where they do, right? So that's one thought at least. I think that, Fra, we are on time, so we return back the mic to you. Thanks everyone for the questions and sorry for the ones that we couldn't answer today. So there are a couple of more questions. Maybe I want to just make everyone happy. So a, a quick answer, if we can, to Josephine, uh, who is asking, how do you keep a team motivated uh, to, pivot, to pivot when global challenges such as the pandemic or business model, everything, <laughs> happens how do you keep them motivated and the other one is how can we prioritize the open potential chances at the big chances at the beginning when we want to make a career shift maybe one russian one Ila, very quick answer for all of them yeah i can go with, with josephine very fast and i think that all the motivation and models outside there like uh, daniel speaking this motivation can work but i think that in this moment of pandemic hope is the first one that you need to have there hope and vision so knowing that even you have a pandemic going on, there is something that you can do. Uh, the pandemic eventually will finish, right? Or will change. And uh, having a vision and having hope really help you as a team to go through a pandemic. That would be one of the things I would highlight. Okay. Um, I can take Ishan's question. Hi, Ishan, nice to see you. Um, I would say that one thing that you can do uh, to get into a new field is to, um, try to experiment with something, you know? Um, what's an organization that you can offer yourself as a volunteer or a consultant, uh, you know, something to get started, right? Something to build your credibility in that field. Because typically when you want to get a full-time job, let's say in the future, they look to see what you've done already. What are your experiences? What's your education? So what can you do to increase your, ex your experiences or your education, whether that's volunteering, whether that's consulting, uh, whether that's taking an online course or taking a course somewhere that can help you build those credentials that uh, people are looking for as well. So, so I think trying to get started, not overthinking all the, the best possible way, but by getting started with the easiest possible way um, and then building from there, that, that could be one way to think about it. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you, Ila. So about getting started, I think there are a few very practical things you can do. One is get your copy of the book. <laughs> the book is available on Amazon and many other uh, bookstores online and in physical <laughs> edition, in paper edition. And uh, so grab your copy of the book. 
And if you're interested in other programs and other initiative of Amani Institute, please follow us on social media where we share continuously opportunities for conversation like this, but also about our programs. And as Miley's already did in the chat, thank you, Miley's. I just want to remind for those who may be interested, we have uh, an edition of the Social Innovation Management Program starting in January. It lasts five months. The application deadline is January 10th, and we have a scholarship deadline today. I don't expect you to apply right now in case you're interested. Take your time to go and look at the website, and Miley has shared the link. And uh, if you are interested, uh, mention this masterclass in your application form, even in the next few days, in case you want to be eligible for a scholarship. Otherwise, there's time until January 10th. And also, I want to mention, hopefully, the pandemic is going slowly uh, to, to become more manageable, let's say. So we are also restarting our social innovation management program in an hybrid version. So with three months online and three months in person in Kenya in the second semester of 2022. So you can also have a look at that. With this, I thank you all for being with us and a special big, big thank you to Roshan and Nila, not only for today, but for the amazing work they have done and for the number of people they have helped in changing their life, me included, but we also have other fellows here. Maybe who is a fellow here want to raise his hand? <laughs> Someone had already left. I see Miley, Comfrey, and who else? <laughs> Ishine. Ishine, yes, and a few more. Someone has just left, but yes, here we are. It's a, a big global crowd and a beautiful crowd. Always nice to see you all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, afternoon, whatever thank time you. is in your region. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.